Not so fast, Denzel. The brilliant physicist Stephen Hawking? My old college roomie? How did we get here? The Fairly Odd Parents premiered 21 years ago in March of 2001. And with the release of the live action reboot for Paramount Plus, I don't think there's a better time to revisit one of the biggest animated series of the 2000s. It's funny, I haven't gone back to the show since it unceremoniously ended in 2017. Didn't something happen with its creator in the years since? <laughs> That's kind of a joke, I think. Man, that was one tough montage. Oh yeah! Prolific Nicktoon creator Butch Hartman has become infamous online, most notably because of this weird tweet where he wrote, Happy Sunday, and attached a photo of Tobias Funke from Arrested Development. Who knows what deep emotions he was trying to express. Maybe Sunday, we'll find out. It's so easy to look at what Hartman has done and assume that the Fairly Odd Parents was actually never good, and hasn't held up. However, most, although definitely not all of the controversies he's endured, occurred or came to light after he left Nick Nickelodeon in 2017. Plus, animation is a team effort, so it doesn't feel right to ignore all the other talent behind this series just because the showrunner is an egotistical public figure. A showrunner who does have writing, storyboarding, or directing credits on dozens of episodes, which make his contributions much harder to overlook, but even so, I'm making a point to separate the art from the artist. Or should I say, the heart from the artist. No, wait, that would have been perfect if those words were somehow reversed. Let's say your balls are looking a little odd. Maybe you have a big problem or your engine's blocked. If you don't want to have any hassle in the castle or get ready for the big bash, then I recommend Manscaped. Manscaped is the global brand for men's grooming and hygiene products who sent me a whole bunch of stuff from their Performance Package 4.0. The star of the show is the Lawn Mower 4.0 Body Trimmer. It's waterproof, has an LED display, a travel lock feature, and a cordless charging system. The wireless Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer uses the same technology and prevents a hurricane from emerging in your nostrils. The Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant is perfect for after you shower, and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray has cooling aloe vera to ensure that you're not foul balled. For a limited time, you get all this plus two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag and the Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs. If you want it to feel like Christmas every day below the belt, go to manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free international shipping plus two free gifts when you use the promo code NICTENDO in all caps at checkout. Manscaped, they prevent you from becoming Timmy's 2D House of Horror. Welcome to the first of a two-part series exploring my relationship with the Fairly Odd Parents over 10 seasons and 16 years on the air. This video will look at the first five seasons or so, which are considered by fans to be the golden age. Because this is such a huge project, I ask that if you enjoyed this video or any of my previous work, please like, subscribe, comment, and ring the bell to be notified when part two drops. It helps me and the channel out a lot. Anyway, every single episode of the Fairly Odd Parents ends with... <laughs> Bum, bum. Predator! Predator Studios is the production company of legendary television executive Fred Seibert. He established MTV's identity as that network's first creative director and served as the last president of Hanna-Barbera. At the latter, he helped Cartoon Network find their first successes in original programming with the Water Cartoon Shorts program, also known as World Premiere Tunes. All 48 of the seven minute shorts were essentially pilots, putting trust in creators both old and new, which was still an emerging concept for animation in the early 90s. After his incubator project led to the creation of the first of Cartoon Network's cartoon cartoons, Cybert founded Frederator Incorporated. Created initially to produce programming for Nickelodeon, Oh Yeah Cartoons was Nick's answer to what a cartoon in more than just format. In the wake of Dexter's Laboratory success, they utilized a similar flat and graphic Hanna-Barbera meets UPA style and tried to find a relatable gimmick for empowering a child character that could be mined for stories. There was a secret talking dog, a secret talking robot, a secret world of Chuck, a secret talking monkey, and secret fairy godparents. I'm Cosmo. I'm Wanda. And we're... Your fairy godparents! What do you think, Timmy? 
I think I'm calling the cops. For the sake of context, let's dive into Butch Hartman's animation background, as it played a huge part in shaping the first series he sold. He initially joined Hanna-Barbera to work on the water cartoon shorts Fish and Chip, Pale Belly Blue, and Gramps, which have a few design aspects that would evolve into his signature style. Afterwards, he'd write, direct, and storyboard episodes of the first cartoon cartoons, most notably Johnny Bravo. Its quick pace, pop culture references, and celebrity cameos would become staples of the Fairly Odd Parents. Here, he met Steve Marmel, who would serve as the head writer on the original run and the first two seasons of Danny Phantom. Along with a few other FOP writers like Jack Thomas, he got his start in stand-up comedy. Marmel even landed an interview on the free speech-centric talk show Speaking Freely. And today we feature the work of two of the next wave of comics in America, Louis C.K. and Steve Marmel. This guy's career is wild. Marmel created This Just In, a topical right-wing adult comedy for Spike TV's adult animation block that asked, what if the critic was about poning the libs? He also wrote Smosh the Movie. Look, all I'm saying is that if we don't get to watch basketball, the terrorists have won. For Oh Yeah Cartoons, Butch Hartman co-created Dan Danger with Marmel, Zoomates with Seth MacFarlane, and Terry and Chris with John Reynolds. Apparently Reynolds was only 12, but he wrote and storyboarded it himself. Butch directed it, which is why it looks and sounds like a lost episode of The Fairly Odd Parents. Check you out. <laughs> Looking at the design of Terry and the lesson he learns, I'm reminded of the season one FOP episode, A Wish Too Far. Terry even buys his secret talking bird at an unusual pet store. So I suppose this short had a long lasting influence on Hartman's work. Of course, his most successful short was The Fairly Odd Parents, so much so that it spawned nine other sequels. And it all started with a reference that predicted the future. It's just like The Simpsons. Oh, Magic Nine Ball, when will my parents get back from the movies? Titanic? Director's caught! They'll be there all night. Man, that's dumb! Speaking of which, I like to think of what fans have labeled Season Zero as being the Fairly Odd Parents equivalent to The Simpsons' Tracy Allman shorts. Although these are technically canon, since later episodes bring back plot elements like the Zappy Awards or a callback to how 10 year old Timmy Turner meets his fairy godparents, Cosmo and Wanda. They're assigned to make Timmy's life under the thumb of his manipulative and sadistic babysitter Vicky a little less miserable. Even with its slower pacing and looser visuals, the pilot does a great job showing off the limitless potential for everything it can be while also putting literal rules in place so that the storytelling can inform the magic. Knowing what this became, there are plenty of jarring differences. Because they couldn't know Vicky's true intentions, Timmy's parents had to be absent to justify most plots, hence them not having faces, Tom and Jerry style. Even in their debut, Mom and Dad showed the same voices as Timmy's godparents, which I always thought was a perfect casting choice. By the way, I'm just gonna start calling them mom and dad in this video because they're never given official first names. It's how they were referred to in the credits, and there was a running gag all about this. Wow, my mom is a kid. Yeah, and she's got a beautiful name. It's... Uh... But everyone calls her mom. When Timmy's dad did take on a personality, he became a dumb weirdo, and the same thing happened to Cosmo, but more gradually. It's funny that one of his rejected designs was a Homer-like idiot slob. Initially, Cosmo and Wanda had an intensely supportive relationship, which worked with how Cosmo was a smooth car salesman type to fit his Phil Hartman-inspired voice. Ooh, may I, Pookie? Of course, stallion. The fairy's magic is more great kazoo than Harry Potter, and having the god couple be bad at granting wishes was frequently the cause of conflicts. Instead of Tim me making a hasty or misworded wish. I guess that's why he's a little more sarcastic here. How we doing so far, Timmy? Don't quit your day job. He reminds me of pitch pilot Phineas. Wow. In order to generate more conflict between them, Cosmo had an ego, while Wanda became more of a nagging wife, attracted to anything with muscles. Can you guess which character traits stuck around in a season written completely by men? Oh, waiter! I'll have a slice of that beefcake! <laughs> Since these are only 7 minute shorts, plots can feel pretty thin, but their structure became less rigid over time. Sometimes there's an antagonist, like the buff fairy academy instructor and Arnold Schwarzenegger parody Jorgen von Strangle, or Cosmo and Wanda can have a subplot at the fairy academy separate from Timmy. We start to explore more settings like Fairy World, which is basically magical Hollywood. I figure that's why most of the fairies are celebrity parodies or showbiz stereotypes. That's an angle that wouldn't be seen again until fairy characters became the driving force behind a few TV and film parodies around season five. The Zappies episode plays up the big band music score that the theme song would adopt. 
In the Oya oh yeah cartoons era and the first season, the soundtrack uses more whimsical and synthesized instruments, which includes a motif for Cosmo and Wanda, which I heard up through season 7. <laughs> The music was composed by Guy Moon, one of the few constants throughout the entire series. He's best known for his Mickey Mousing, or playing along to an action as it plays out on screen. We're magic! Ooh! Magic! Ooh! His work got more noisy over time, and he'd start to recycle cues left and right towards the end of the run. But for better or worse, this is still one of the most memorable animation scores of the 21st century. All the homies are still bumping his records. <laughs> In terms of audio, one of the saddest aspects is how Timmy was originally played by voice actress Mary Kay Bergman, best known for voicing most of the female characters on South Park until she took her life in November 1999. Between the shorts in season 1, Tara Strong took over the role and she dubbed over Bergman for the sake of consistency in reruns. The good news is that both versions are easily accessible online, but I think Strong sounds out of place when talking to the early voices of the other characters. Sweet girl. I love her fangs. You grant wishes, huh? You grant wishes, huh? There's a neat novelty to going back to these shorts and see the fairly odd parents be animated on cells with less geometric designs, figure out where a character or drawing originated from, like Garfeldi himself, or notice how Butch Hartman's signature hairstyle was even more prominent. Although I for one think that design mentality is a little genius, because if you're a young artist, that's how you might draw the hair of your own fairy or godchild OCs, kind of like copying the specific body type of a My Little Pony character. Time after time, the creative team proved that the comedy and characters could live up to the high concept premise. I think that's why this stood out from all the other shorts pitched to Nickelodeon during Oya oh yeah cartoons. It's too bad they couldn't keep the original name, which was simply the Fairy Godparents. Since they replaced God with Odd, I feel compelled to do the same. Ah, damn it! Looks like we'll be here a while. Well, at least we'll be clean! <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Oh, you tell me. <laughs> Dude, are you talking to your fish? Yes. The rest of this video will cover the shows season by season. Since there are about 300 segments all together, I'd run out of things to say if I covered all the formulaic 11 minute episodes individually. I couldn't even stop that from happening when I was taking notes. Season 1 is only 6 half hours, but they played a big role in shaping the cast and identity of the series in its early years. It began by building off of its past instead of starting from scratch, expecting that you already know the status quo from the shorts. In the series premiere The Big Problem, Mom and Dad now have faces to give them more of a presence, and Timmy attends school for the first time, where we meet his friends Chester and AJ and Bully Francis, all three of which are very basic sidekicks or threats at this point. It's also about Timmy wishing he was an adult and becoming a homeless creep that Vicky blows a rape whistle on, twice. It's one of the most cynical and dark episodes from the whole run, but it makes a strong first impression. It never becomes too drab thanks to how charming it is from the get-go, like it's always moving on to the next joke or scene, and Cosmo and Wanda are always upbeat. I wish I was older! Well, how do I look? Ew. Even in some of my favorite episodes, I'd say that the Fairly Odd Parents is more often just charming than laugh out loud funny. That's not a bad thing, it just means that the draw for me is the stories and characters more than the comedy, although there are killer gags here and there. Besides, I have three lives. Vicky is at the center of exactly half of season one, so it was a breath of fresh air to see the introduction of Timmy's fairy obsessed teacher, Mr. Crocker, in the episode Transparents. Hey, good for them. Crocker is a subdued, low tech conspiracy theorist here, with Principal Waxoplax being the one who keeps him in check. He's definitely the supporting character who'd evolved the most, but it's neat to see the genesis of concepts like the Crocker Cave and his ambition for world domination. There's only one logical explanation. Fairy Godparents! Other important additions include Trixie Tang, Timmy's one-note love interest, Mama Cosma, Cosmo's overprotective mother, Dr. Bender, the evil dentist who teaches Timmy about discrimination, and the Crimson Chin, the Silver Age comics hero who has an existential crisis when Timmy wishes him into the real world. I'm glad we're pals, whether I'm real or not. You're part of my continuity now. The scenes inside the comic book show off the versatility of the art style, with how well lit and stylized the setting is. When every episode could potentially have a brand new setting, I understand why they went for backgrounds that I can recreate in MS Paint. In 
the video game parody Power Man, small CGI elements are integrated into the visuals, some of which are used to parody an iconic scene from The Matrix. Matrix references are really funny to me because with a few notable exceptions like The Matrix, they only reference the same few flashy scenes. The Matrix! There's Bullet Time, one of the Neo and Mr. Smith face-offs, the stockroom scene, and a 360 camera rotation. Come on! Where are the references to that not safe for work cave rave scene in The Matrix Reloaded? At least these parodies always seem to nail the music. And I like how Guy Moon's score this season experimented with different kinds of jazz, along with techno music that you find on Danny Phantom. It's a little amateurish, but it gives these episodes their own flavor. Wow, this copy stuff is great. Copy, 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 great. Oh, where did they get this stuff? Columbia. As Cosmo's voice started becoming more and more high pitched, probably to distinguish him from Dad, Cosmo and Wanda's relationship got an upgrade. You guys don't do anything halfway, do you? Nope, we're two halves of a whole idiot. They shine in subplots where they're separated from Timmy which would rarely be found in standard episodes beyond this season. Cosmo isn't as bright as his wife, but they both scrub Timmy's wishes, are surprisingly codependent, and support each other through their mistakes. I'm sorry I yelled at you, Puddin. I promise I won't do it unless you really mess up again. Like I will tomorrow? Mom and Dad still don't have a major presence, but Timmy learns the importance of his father's accomplishments in the season's best entry, Father Time. Many early stories were based around sci-fi tropes, to diversify the genres that the show could tackle, which made every new adventure all the more exciting. Timmy going back in time after melting his father's trophy and accidentally causing 1984 is a great concept on its own, but this one also shows off the comedic potential Dad has, and has a little self-awareness by not being afraid to point out its own flaws. Wow, the time stream! We're traveling 30 years into the past! Well, you know, you could have just wished yourself 10 minutes into the past and stopped yourself from melting the trophy in the first place! I could have what? Season 1 is short and simple, but its identity continued to solidify, minus some presentation aspects or characterizations that the Fairly Odd Parents would quickly grow out of. The worst it gets is when it has stories or morals that I've seen countless times. If I gotta pick my least favorite entry, I guess I'll go with Dream Goat, a simple liar reveal plot about Dimsdale believing Timmy to be a hero. A simple liar reveal plot about Dimsdale believing Timmy to be a hero after he set the town mascot free. I love how Timmy's sleep wishes look, but otherwise, I can see why this is one of the few parts of the original run that I completely forgot about. Oh look, there's a picture of me after I finished this video series. How'd that get in there? Is it the rest of my life yet? Season 2? More like Season 2K. Because this is where the Fairly Odd Parents became 2000's core, and nothing could escape its influence. The premiere tackled boy bands, with the introduction of teen sensation Chip Skylark, voiced by Chris Kirkpatrick of NSYNC, whose design you can see evolve in real time. During a period where boy band hate had reached an all-time high, it was refreshing to see this pop star portrayed as an actual human being that gets to have a likable personality and isn't rich since he's micromanaged by his record company. It helps that Chip's debut ends with Icky Vicky, one of several stellar songs that quickly became a staple of the series. Hey Vicky, you're so, so icky. Just the thought of being around you makes me oh so sicky. The one that gets stuck in my head the most is I Wish Every Day Could Be Christmas, from the self-explanatorily titled Christmas Every Day. And that's how I found out explanatorily was a word. I wish every day could be Christmas, cause Santa brings gifts every year. He's reading my list, he's feeding the deer, he's hauling my gifts from the North Pole to here. This is the first half hour episode, and the first truly great episode in general. We get to see the impact of Timmy's wish on a worldwide scale, other magic beings are introduced for the first time, at least in this series, and the winter setting livens up the atmosphere. Who would have thunk that the news anchor Chet You Betcha would become the most enduring element to debut here? Beyond the great presentation and toe tapping musical number, Christmas Every Day remains my favorite part of season two for having the most relatable wish, at least when I was a kid. Nowadays, I'd wish for Timmy to be my lawyer. I wish my client Catman was not guilty!
Another standout is Information Stupor Highway, where Timmy enters cyberspace to retrieve a threatmantic letter to Trixie. The adventurous core concept holds up, since having a slow internet connection, embarrassing emails, and parents who respect their child's privacy by knocking but assert their authority by coming in anyway aren't going anywhere. Now the bulky PCs, bootleg Windows 95 interface, and Tron-inspired visuals are all very dated. But the story still holds up without these, and I think there's a charm in how much of a product of its time this is overall. I'm surfing the web! Literally. Unless they're doing a Y2K retro future kind of thing, no cartoon will ever interpret the internet like this again. There was a 3D groove Nick Arcade game based on this episode that I always wanted to play as a kid. And while the character models are janky, the look of this simple racing game is actually pretty faithful. It's a neat product of its day. As Timmy travels from one computer to another, we learn a lot about the inner lives of Timmy's peers and meet a few of their parents, including Mr. Crocker's. Mother, stop interrupting! Can't you see I'm busy ranting? We also get what's far and away the best moment from Trixie's best friend, Veronica. When she first appears in A Wish Too Far, I don't think Veronica is ever stated to be as rich as the kid she hangs out with. In fact, Trixie cements her social status the moment she speaks. Hey, Trixie! Hello, popular girl, yet less popular than me, Veronica. Trixie, Tad, and Chad tend to respect each other, but not Veronica. <laughs> So that makes the reveal that she secretly idolizes Trixie and loves Timmy really intriguing. Why can't I be you? Veronica, dinner. Don't call me that. Call me Trixie. I'm Trixie. It's lame that both Timmy and the show itself thought that Veronica could only be crazy and pathetic, because this is a great idea that never went anywhere. Why is this loser talking to me? Oh, sure, she's saying that, but let's see if that's how she really feels. Why is this loser talking to me? Why isn't that loser talking to me? Season two loved fleshing out the supporting cast. Trixie is given a social weakness in a great episode about breaking gender boundaries. I'm sure that it will never be undermined multiple times in the future. If word gets out, I like boy stuff, all my friends will think I'm weird. Mom and dad support their son more often and are portrayed as workaholics that make poor financial choices instead of always being neglectful parents. That's my office. Cool, I'm unemployed. Mr. Crocker has more advanced technology for detecting and searching for fairies. I'm just hunting fairies. Chester and AJ are given defining characteristics or backstories, appearing more often to keep Timmy in touch with elementary school culture or just be jerks to him. Win or lose, your friends will still love you. Really? Timmy better win or we're not gonna love him anymore. Would you believe that this joke became a cornerstone of this cartoon's comedy? I call it the Butch Subversion, or BS for short. What are you gonna do? Make three tickets appear by magic? <laughs> What do you mean I can't just make three tickets appear like magic? More importantly, Chester is voiced by one of the most popular sitcom stars of the 2000s, Frankie Muniz. And for that reason, I'm distracted by every line that comes out of his mouth. A Timmy Turner action figure with thumb sucking action. Yo! Hey everybody, I'll be hosting the Fox Box next week. Who are you? I'm Frankie Muniz. A through line for many of the kid characters is having single or inattentive parents that motivate their misery. AJ is the exception, although he is one of the only people of color in the entire city, so that's gotta be depressing. Not even resident rich snob Remy Buxapunny can escape this trend, and his arrogance towards Timmy causes him to lose the one thing keeping his life bearable. My parents are never home! I never get to see them! Why should you get real parents and godparents that love you when I don't? This cynicism towards childhood begins to affect the comedy, which could work if those specific gags weren't as lazy. Hail to the Chief jokes about Principal Waxaplax being fat, poor kid Chester eating garbage, and has an Indian kid voiced by a white Harry. man. Sanjay was always the weakest member of Timmy's friend group because his personality can be summed up in any clip that you watch of him. Oh my gosh! His newly muscled self moves with the power and grace of the Bengal tiger! He talks differently, laugh. More potentially offensive comedy can be found in season two's low point, Twistery. Timmy causes the British to win the Revolutionary War when he brings the Founding Fathers to the present. The conflict kicks in too late, and not only are the historical jokes predictable, but so are the jokes about British people. I say, this is a bit of a sticky wicket.
I mean, dude, this stinks! They talk differently, laugh. We're introduced to other new side characters. Like Timmy's unrequited love interest, Tootie, the evil doppelgangers that evolved from a concept in an Oya cartoon short, The Anti-Fairies, the Turner's neighbors that Dad has a one-sided hatred of and debuts driving a fighting robot, Sheldon Dinkelberg, one of the only guys cool enough to say the word sexy on Nickelodeon, Wandissimo Magnifico, and Super Toilet. <laughs> There's also this Texan tycoon guy. Uh, what was his name again? Doug Dimmadome, the owner of the Dimmsdale Dimmadome. That's right, Doug Dimmadome, owner of the. That's right, Doug Dimmadome, owner of the. That's right, Doug Dimmadome, owner of the. Doug Dimmadome, 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 Doug Dim
out midway through all the topics I plan on covering today, let's take a break from the Fairly Odd Parents to talk about the Fairly Odd Parents breaking the rules. It's probably the most well-known piece of merchandise, and the first of two multi-platform video games published by THQ that I happen to own. There were a few other titles exclusive to the Game Boy Advance, like the GBA video compilations, Enter the Cleft, and Clash with the Anti-World. The latter is notable for having region-exclusive cover art and introducing new concepts like Anti-Pixies, Anti-Timmy, and Anti-Jorgen before he had his first speaking role. Oh, I made macaroni bean chimes! <laughs> With Break Into Rules, Blitz Games had the challenge of bringing the cartoon entirely into the third dimension. The plot has Timmy and his fairies collecting pages of the rules to restore their magic after Vicky accidentally gains wish-granting powers from the book. After completing the tutorial, most of the levels are available to complete in any order, a la Mega Man. I like the colorful cel-shaded art style, but the models are rough around the edges and have a very limited number of animations. That becomes an issue when I'm stopping every few minutes to watch an unskippable cutscene where Timmy, Cosmo, and Wanda just stand around and chat. Look past the alien! Don't wake him! Environments like Timmy's house are faithfully designed, but the majority are filled with recycled assets or feel too empty. There aren't enough enemies, collectibles, or NPCs in locations that feel unpopulated. To its credit, each new chapter features unique environments, power-ups, mini-games, or boss battles to mix up the monotonous gameplay. Although it's not all equally polished, even Timmy's basic jump and the sometimes fixed camera could use some work. Sound-wise, the music contains lots of low-key jazzy bangers and the whole main voice cast returns, just with compressed audio that can be hard to make out sometimes. The most exciting part of checking this game out for the first time was seeing all of the callbacks to seasons 1 and 2, and even an Oya oh yeah cartoon short. It was cool to play through certain moments, like the three tests of the Yucopotamians from Totally Spaced Out, or explore a version of the Crocker Cave that was somewhere between its first and second appearances, where it went from a phone booth to an actual cave underneath the school. Break Into Rules is a charming but otherwise average 3D platformer. Even so, it proved that the Fairly Odd Parents could work in a more ambitious medium for over 22 minutes, with a script written without the original writing team. And those ideas would help shape its future, both for TV viewers and for gamers, which is obviously the more important audience of the two. Whoa! Cool game, Timmy! Yeah! Can't wait for the sequel! Round three one. Well done, Timmy! You did great! Yeah, and we found more pages of the rules! I feel more magical already! Welcome to Season 3. The line art is thinner, the colors are brighter, and the pop culture references are plentiful. Most of them hold up since they call back to beloved classics or the Star Wars prequel trilogy, but it's jarring to see references to the 2001 Planet of the Apes remake or hear a 2000s kid show name drop real life movie titles and celebrities. Who are you? I'm uh, one of America's most beloved comedy entertainers. Fine, shemp. This includes two more Matrix references, since the sequels are coming out. And look, there's gags about a Neo and Smith fight in the stockroom scene. I can check two overdone references off my list. Stay tuned for part two to see the epic conclusion of this really funny joke. A trio of blockbuster parodies kick off the first three-part special, Abracatastrophe, where Timmy receives a magic muffin that grants him one rule-free wish that naturally ends up in the wrong hands. The animators completely overdid it with the number of CGI models they have that only appear for a few seconds. Sometimes it looks choppy, but I love how ambitious they got with having the flat characters move and scale around these stylized 3D assets. They're the reason why I always think of the openings to these specials whenever I see this shot from Rick and Morty. The plot gets stronger as it goes along, with the first part needing to introduce subplots, musical numbers, and typical school scenes to reach the 22 minute mark. I think they lose a little steam the first time a wish radically transforms the world. You know, there's only so many ways the joke, monkeys like bananas, can be told. But all the build-up and exposition pays off in the second half. It wouldn't feel as grand if the runtime was only 44 minutes. Abra Catastrophe proves that the Fairly Odd Parents can be more serious and action-oriented, and helps Mr. Crocker come into his own. 
he gets his own leitmotif, he lives out the fantasy he dreamed about in Transparence, and he goes on to star in the season's highlight, The Secret Origin of Denzel Crocker. Timmy goes back in time, again, to uncover the day that his teacher's life was ruined. Each time period featured here is littered with fitting references, and it's cool that the origins of other adult characters were included as well. Wow! She's a maniac, that's for sure! I can buy that this was always meant to be Mr. Crocker's backstory, cause it naturally links his past with Timmy's present without the tragic elements feeling forced. Chester and AJ get their own dedicated episodes like The Big Scoop, which gives them their own hobby as journalists for the school newspaper, and explains what they were up to during A Wish Too Far in season one. It also referenced famous Las Vegas performers Siegfried and Roy. I hope nothing bad happened to them exactly eight days after this episode aired. Moving on, Chester and AJ both received new voice actors. Timmy? Dude, you look positively popular. Where'd you get all this stuff? Timmy? You look positively popular. Where'd you get all this stuff? According to Hartman, Frankie Muniz got busy being a movie star, and he doesn't know why AJ's VA stopped doing it. It looks like he stopped acting a year or two later, after groundbreaking uncredited roles like The Kid in Malcolm in the Middle's pilot. I really loved when he stood in the background. I don't even know which kid is the kid. Chester is now played by Jason Marsden, and AJ is now played by Gary Leroy Gray. Their performances are very different, but I like both of them more, probably since they have more experience doing voice work. Timmy's mom and dad continued to be fleshed out through some plot lines about adulting instead of just parenting, like realizing something from your childhood doesn't hold up. Ooh, the birthplace of Dimsdale, Dimsdale Flats, abandoned and empty just like my childhood. Even I can relate to that. Being eaten by coyotes and locked in a jail made me realize my childhood stunk. Chip Skylark made two appearances and brought two new songs with him, the fan favorite Shiny Teeth and the less appreciated Find Your Voice. Thanks, Timmy. You're the best. Word. Don't say that. I'd say Chip Off the Old Chip is the better of the pair for being a story about Chip himself instead of just Chip's teeth. And I personally prefer that episode's song for having a slightly more personal message than Brush Your Teeth or Vicky Sucks. With how similar Chip Skylark's appearances were, both in episode and basic song structure, I get why he was relegated to cameos after this season. A character voiced by and based on trendy boy bands from the early aughts just wasn't built to last. I do like how Chip was given his own color flipped rival in Skip Sparky Pants. The Crimson Shin got one too and his name was oh yeah i'm not saying that season three enjoyed fleshing out the rogues gallery turning nuisances like dr bender francis doug dimidome and dinkelberg sort of into main antagonists although most of them wouldn't become mainstays other new additions include the dream-seeking drama teacher mr bickles new crimson chin enemies like the water themed h2 olga and celebrity parodies like britney britney i'm kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel to discuss important new characters at this point i sincerely apologize for all of those hoping for an in-depth file on Crusher McPherson Crusher or Sylvester Calzone. Just the best I got. Ooh, God! Timmy, Cosmo, and Wanda were the primary focus of most episodes, although their dynamic had slightly shifted. I love you guys, but you're idiots! But we're, we're your idiots! Wanda came into her own as the capable voice of reason that's usually the one saving the day, and Cosmo's personality went from being defined by his eccentricity to his stupidity. Timmy still has the same kind of wants and needs, but now he and Cosmo are two halves of a whole idiot, and they work well when paired up. I thought you said plastic surgery! Good for him. The interactions within this trio are still strong, but there's a lot more infighting. I fully understand if people cannot stand this cartoon for how much of the comedy comes from the characters screaming. It's not always funny. At the same time, Pipe Down is great despite lacking dialogue and relying solely on the visuals. The way the conflict is kicked off feels purposely tongue in cheek. <laughs> I want his complete and utter silence! Thinking about this criticism made me appreciate the season's atmospheric moments, and the highbrow humor in episodes like Mighty Mom and Dino Dad meet the Crimson Chin. There's a lot of great jabs at comic reboots, like I didn't realize you can say Commie Buster on Nickelodeon. Having one or two self-aware or culturally aware lines became more common after season two. Thanks for not using your amazing powers to end world hunger and help me clean my room instead, guys! Around this time, the show reached the height of its popularity, becoming the number two most popular children's program on TV by by the end of 2002, second only to SpongeBob. They started to pump out these special issues of Nickelodeon Magazine, 
instead of having unrelated stories, some of their comics tie directly into the heavily promoted episodes, like having Timmy return to a world ruled by monkeys, or exploring other origins of the Crimson Chin. Thanks to Jacob Russell on Twitter for sending his old issues to me. All this was happening when Fairly Odd Parents merch was landing on store shelves. Perfect timing for an episode demonizing cheap toys, while they're trying to sell cheap toys like this. Now, the art in these Nickelodeon magazine comics was sort of wonky, but the same could be said for the animated series, particularly around this time when they were switching over to refined character models. I spotted some instances of what I like to call model sheet looking ass, especially on these title cards. It's funny how often they redrew Timmy's reference model pose. The artist probably didn't have much time to do title cards because this continues into season five. It can also be found in my least favorite episode yet, Love Struck. Timmy wishes that the boys and girls of Dim's were separated on Valentine's Day, and it heavily simplifies male and female gender roles into being a battle of slobs versus snobs. Here it is, Cosmo, the wall that separates us from the girls. The girl in wall. We're gonna tear down this wall. I like the first song, Cupid's expanded role, and Timmy's decision to accept Tootie's unconditional love over Trixie's superficial love. While I feel like Lovestruck conceptually does a great job looking at romance from a child's point of view, it never escapes stereotypes, which distract from a decently fun story. It's the odd man out in what is otherwise the best season yet, cause even when episodes are going through the motions, they're still packed with jokes or unique story sure. solutions. This is far from a perfect season, but I was the most invested while watching this one, which is a fancy way of saying that it's all downhill from here. Wow. I just had two weeks of head exploding summer fun, and Vicky's gonna rot in a federal jail. Quiet! I'm watching Timmy! I get the feeling that when season four began production around 2002 or 2003, it was in the wake of Sam Raimi's massively popular Spider Man movie, and the Fairly Odd Parents crew splitting off to work on the more action oriented Danny Phantom, Butch Hartman's second Nicktoon. I say that because we got five stories devoted to heroes, both old and new. There's three episodes starring the Crimson Chin, three different parodies of Batman, and too many similar sounding action cues for Guy Moon to write. <laughs> It's easy to feel fatigued with the sheer volume of these in one season, but they all increase the scope beyond Timmy typically entering a Crimson Chin comic book. It's completely different because now Timmy enters the identical looking Crimson Chin webtoon. To my surprise, that actually existed as a flash game on Nick.com for a short time, but the segments also aired as interstitials and were compiled on an early DVD. I would have liked to see more crossover with the FOP series for these webtoons, because otherwise it sets unrealistically high standards for the animation and pacing in these online exclusives. What's this? A public domain scream for help? Log on to Nick.com to find out, and stay tuned for more adventures of the Crimson Chin and Cleft the Boy Chin Wonder. Believe it or not, the thing that I wanted to happen almost happened. According to these storyboards from artist Mark Manley, I found that at least two shorts were scrapped, as only six webtoons were originally produced. Two of them would have featured Timmy and the Crimson Chin taking on parodies of the Super Friends, the Power Pals, after they were hypnotized. They first showed up to teach Timmy a lesson, but they serve as fun villains in these quick shorts, which looked like they would have been visually on par with the TV episode. It's too bad they weren't finished. Most of this focus on superheroes was motivated by the numerous appearances of Adam West, playing an exaggerated version of himself with the alter ego of former TV character Catman. No relation to the Batman villain with the same name and color scheme. They really tested the limits of parody law. I think the best superpowered outing out of this bunch was the big superhero wish. It gets a little sidetracked by promoting the importance of local heroes, but it gets plenty of fun designs and clever twists out of Timmy wishing that his life was more like a comic book as well as possibly my favorite joke in all of the Fairly Odd Parents. You might think it's just me, until you see what's behind Mike, the evil living building! Thank odd he has his own wiki page. I was wondering what his interests were. Live action humans made their first appearance, which was utilized well to enhance a parody or for celebrity cameos. Although I'll argue that real life people look surprisingly good in this art style. I guess this means that the Cosmo and Wanda cameo in Ned's The Classified School Survival Guide could be considered canon. It happened during a daydream, so I say it counts. Wish there was a way into that room. Hey Wanda, I've got an idea. How about we help out secret agent Ned? The fairly odd parents? Hey, it's my daydream. 
Additionally, The Big Superhero Wish was the first episode to be a direct continuation. And while this season is more interested in one-off adventures instead of heavy world building or fleshing out the sporting cast, it loves joking about character histories or bringing back obscure elements. The only reason I'm here is because I'm frosting intolerant. What's the most powerful and influential educator in Dimsdale doing at the Cake and Bacon? Why, eating bacon, of course! Remember, I'm frosting intolerant. The continuity is firing on all cylinders with the finale schools at the musical. It's kind of a culmination for all of season four, capping off a mini arc with the Pixies, a newly introduced threat to fairy kind defined by their blocky, boring businessman designs and entirely voiced by the perfectly monotone no. Ben Stein. If you're wondering why the background music sounds so muffled right now, that's because I took an instrumental from a Flash game used to promote this special. I think this is what Friday Night Funkin' was based on. The musical gives a starring role to Flappy Bob, who runs the recently reintroduced Camp Learnatorium. His voice actor, as Scott Book, kills all of his numbers. I mean, really murders them. He's so good at getting emotion out of Flappy Bob's struggle and choosing to become a greedy businessman or a clown, which is basically what growing a YouTube channel is like. The duet with Timmy that he slowly takes over during the climax has to be my favorite song in the whole series. Where is the fun? Who should I turn to? Where is the fun? How can I learn who? Who is the one? The one I can trust to tell me what's fun. A few season four episodes like Mind Over Magic or Emotion Commotion feel very chaotic with how their premises are explored and escalate. And Schools Out brings that energy to musical numbers that move a mile a minute and move the plot along. They frequently swap between fantastical visuals happening inside and outside of the actual story. And there's so much happening on screen. I counted about 65 unique backgrounds in under two minutes, which is insane and definitely would have been less feasible with a more detailed art style. None of this is enough to distract me from how catchy most of the music is, except for the intro. I'm always taken aback by how similar it is to the opening credits of Monsters, Inc. Another episode that also happens to start at the beginning of Summer Vacation is Shelf Life, a double-length chase through the world of literature after Tom Sawyer is wished into the real world and cons Cosmo out of his wand. Like Scary Godparents before it, the meat of the story doesn't appear until halfway through, and it's got a repetitive format of going into a book, seeing what words Tom changed, making a really long Josie and the Pussycats reference, going through yet another CGI portal, and rinse and repeat. Jason and the Pussycats We got guitars and pirate hats on the outset, it feels like the Fairly Odd Parents barely struggle to make half our episodes because they were consistently highlights of the classic era. But I think the ones written around a theme or gags, rather than something more ambitious and character driven, don't justify the extended format. Each of the books that Timmy, Cosmo, and Wanda travel into have unique backgrounds, and that willingness to experiment with the visuals would carry over into the other big special from this batch Channel Chasers. Let's go. Yes, I'm in the camp who believes that this is their magnum opus. Timmy uses a magic remote to run away into television, but has to travel through dozens of channels to stop Vicky from changing history. It's the climax of a very Vicky heavy season, one that continues making her occasionally sympathetic. Unless TV channels find a way to stay relevant in the streaming age, this might become more outdated than Information Super Highway. But Timmy learning to accept his parents and his future is handled with nuance, with the time travel subplot and TV parodies balancing out the tone perfectly. Wow, these credits are moving fast! They're animation credits. They go really fast because nobody cares about them. It does all this by managing to include every major character, have extremely faithful art style changes, and build a seemingly endless world out of channel surfing. Art director George Goodchild outdid himself. No wonder he stuck around for the rest of the series. There's quite a bit of fluff to meet the runtime, a disgustingly animated Rankin Bass parody, a cut musical number that was still used as an instrumental without any explanation, and a Dragon Ball parody written by people who seemingly haven't watched anime since Speed Racer. But everything I love about the Fairly Odd Parents is here. Plus, it's easy to overlook minor issues when the emotional core is so strong and complex. Cool! I'm in the TV! There's actually 
actually another deleted scene found on the Channel Chasers DVD that I've never seen anyone upload online. <laughs> Butch Hartman! I previously mentioned the mediocre print-on-demand season releases that the Fairly Odd Parents got from Amazon, but the DVDs and VHS tapes produced by Paramount Home Entertainment in the early 2000s were also subpar. They were aimed at kids instead of collectors, so they only featured 6 to 10 segments, and the special features didn't have the creator commentaries or behind-the-scenes interviews that you would find on the SpongeBob or Ren and Stimpy season box sets from around that time. On the bright side, they archived all of the Crimson Chin webtoons, some of the Oya oh yeah cartoons, and Abracatastrophe got a commentary track with Cosmo and Wanda where they occasionally do CinemaSin style nitpicking on their own movie. By far the strangest special feature is on the Schools at the Musical DVD, where Timmy, Cosmo, and Wanda are interviewed by Caduce from MTV's music video request show Total Request Live. The animation and gags are nothing special, but there's something slightly haunting about watching a clip with minimal sound effects and no background music. And my next guests have amazing magic powers entertain millions and don't need white tigers to do it. Sorry guys, you're fired! Apparently, most of the episode that this was featured in is lost. On April 23rd, 2004, TRL premiered the music video for New Found Glories It's All Downhill From Here, alongside animated segments where the host interview characters from Family Guy and the Powerpuff Girls. I hope the rest of this surfaces online someday, because imagine seeing Timmy Turner and Peter Griffin appear in the same episode of television! The only other remnant of this event is a brief crossover promo for Sly 2 Band of Thieves. Hey! Please, I dig rappers, not raccoons. Speaking of traveling to other TV shows, the first Jimmy Timmy Power Hour aired during this season. It's a team up that makes sense, considering the small overlap between productions, like Guy Moon composing the song for Holly Jolly Jimmy, or Hartman and Marmel penning the episode that ends with Jimmy becoming a gelatinous blob. Even though I firmly believe that Timmy Turner and friends were never meant to be rendered in the third dimension, the humor and storytelling of both cartoons are very compatible, although it probably would have flowed better if they cut between the two universes more. Apparently, the DNA animation team struggled with the shot where the protagonists shake hands. They needed to rotoscope the FOP animation to sync up the differing frame rates of the two animation styles. I'm surprised it came out looking as good as it did. That might be why these crossovers are very careful about combining art styles, explaining why there wasn't a more visually creative combination of the show's two theme songs, instead of just having alternating boomboxes. I still like it, but I can't admit that it's a little lazy. With over one quarter of season four made up of specials, I understand why the 11 minute episodes feel a little more typical. On the whole, things feel slightly less memorable, even though there's more comedy. The formula was beginning to wear thin. Ugh. These loopholes are really annoying! On the plus side, I had the hardest time figuring out which was the worst one out of this bunch. I decided to go with Truth or Cosmoquences, which I only wrote two notes on. Liar Revealed episode and Timmy Piss subplot. I think they speak for themselves. I know some people in the comments will argue in favor of just the two of us, where Timmy wishes that he and Trixie were the last two people on Earth. Trixie becomes a crazy nag who needs constant validation, because all of the women in this series need to be crazy, stupid, or a nag. It goes against her early characterization that I previously discussed, and I can see why it rubbed fans the wrong way. Trixie's used to having hundreds of boys adoring her! With just me here, she wants me to adore her as much as hundreds of boys! However, not only does the plot take place over a number of hours during a scenario where one could understandably crack under pressure, but it was a chance for voice actress Diane Kwan to explore the range of her character. I missed you! Didn't you miss me? Where did you go? The likes of Dad and Mr. Crocker were also developed based on the performances of their actors. This is just the most noticeable with Trixie because she's barely had any major roles. Go back to something like Emotion Commotion and you can see how she overreacts when lacking attention even back then. I'm ignoring you. I said I'm ignoring you. Stop ignoring me, ignoring you! In other words, there were a couple of times when she really snapped and acted like a lunatic. I still dislike the shallow way Trixie was written in just the two of us, but I acknowledge that interpretation didn't come out of nowhere. Just be ready for more characters whose personalities are compromised just for the sake of a joke or a storyline. We barely scratched the surface on that front. What's the worst your dad could do as mayor? <laughs> Working, Dinkleberg! I gotta say, 
say, having a big brother was cool, but not having a big brother is even cooler. That's not even a good lesson. Season five should be the best one yet. If you ask me what some of my favorite episodes are, a good chunk of them are probably from this run. What's the Difference and Presto Changeo were another pair that ran wild with their comedic premises. Nearly every plot involves side characters, giving starring roles to Tootie or Mr. Bickles instead of Vicky or Trixie for the umpteenth time, which kept the conflicts fresh. Timmy wasn't always the protagonist and obscure character attributes returned, like I forgot that AJ had a secret Dexter-esque laboratory in his bedroom. We got to the point of having whole stories devoted to callbacks, like Jorgen and the Tooth Fairy being a couple, which hadn't been mentioned since the Oya oh yeah cartoons days. A worse example is Escape from Unwish Island, since most of the returning wishes barely do anything. It marks the second, and unfortunately final appearance of Imaginary Gary, Timmy's vengeful imaginary friend. This season 5 outing doesn't do this conceptually cool character justice. At some point, he was set to return in schools at the musical. Based on a rough draft of the reprise remix, Flappy Bob was originally Gary in disguise. The Pixies were still a part of the story, so maybe it was deemed too complicated to virtually have three villains. There's a few attempts at world building with the introduction of new relatives. How come we haven't visited Wanda's sister before this? I'm trying to remember. We get Wanda's celebrity sister Blonda and garbage mob boss father Big Daddy, catching the tail end of Soprano's hype. To clarify, he is a mob boss of garbage, not a garbage father. I'm not sure if this line from season one has aged well or poorly as a result of his character. What's the matter, Big Daddy? References to The Godfather or The Brady Bunch unfortunately became the main source of comedy a few times, but it's still more appealing than Cosmo name-dropping random celebrities. Now he's a villain and a genius! Just like Dr. Phil! He knows who Dr. Phil is! Laugh! Anyway, the introduction of Big Daddy continued that trend of having miserable children with a single parent, to the point that they actually paired up Cosmo and Wanda's parents. Timmy's grandpappy starred in a tribute to Fleischer-era black and white cartoons, the good old days. While it accidentally reinforced the idea that animation used to be better back in the day, which the show would go on to support by actually living up to that stigma, they definitely didn't lose their ability to copy other art styles after Channel Chasers. Captain Green and the Eco Teens picking up fresh and aside Looks like someone won't be welcomed at the Captain Planet Foundation in Atlanta, Georgia. The straightforward comedy and upbeat nature of this one reminded me of Wander Over Yonder, since it was conceived by Dave Thomas, a driving force behind that series and El Tigre. Another Wander crew member, Ben Ballesteri, designed characters for Crash Nebula, a backdoor pilot revolving around Timmy's favorite TV hero. A special episode of Crash Nebula is on today! The one where he travels backwards in time, lands in the Old South, and finds out he's actually his own great-grandfather? Ah! Writing-wise, it felt generic and didn't give me a strong reason to care about the cast, but I love the very designs of the alien students at the Celestial Academy, the detailed shading and ambitious CGI, and an impressive voice cast that included Michael Clark Duncan, Queen Latifah, and Justin Burfield from Malcolm in the Middle. There's only room for one space hero in this class, and it's gonna be me. Dewey, Dewey, guess what? I finally figured out what kind of genius I am. I guess this pilot didn't get picked up because... Life is unfair. Oh, and poor Fook is testing too. Speaking of aliens, this was a good year for Mark Chang. The Yucopotamians were kind of one note early on, but I still enjoyed hearing Rob Paulson put on a surfer dude dialect to play a space squid. That weird vocal direction made that character so much more charming. What's up? After Mark fled to Earth to escape the deranged bride-to-be of his arranged marriage in probably his best episode, his appearances became much more varied. Sometimes he's disguised as a student in Timmy's class, and sometimes he's wiping Timmy's memory of a relationship he had with an adult woman. Hi, I'm Timmy. Timmy? Carly? And that's how Butch Hartman decided to put one of his daughter's names into a children's show. On paper, this season sounds like one of the better parts of these early years, but I wouldn't hesitate in calling it one of the worst so far. So many episodes are brought down by the treatment of Wanda. She's the victim of numerous female stereotypes. Wanda is fat. Wanda is clingy. Wanda is attracted to any man with muscles. And of course, Wanda is a nag. Let's, Let's do the, the nag, nag dance! dance. You nag it to the left, you nag it to the right, I always nag my husband all day and night! I got frustrated with episodes like Big Wanda, because so much of the humor boils down to a character's gender. Instead of making her more sympathetic, Wanda often takes her anger out on Cosmo whenever he screws up. It kind of hurts the escapism of the series when this once loving couple has become more dysfunctional than the parents they were sent to replace. Goodbye! Ah! 
Making Wanda violent is such a lazy way to combat Cosmo's ever-increasing stupidity, and it makes the Fairly Odd Parents less fun to watch, especially when its cynical side reaches a boiling point with the worst of season 5. It's a wishful life. Timmy wishes that he was never born, and Jorgen shows off how the lives of everyone he knows are much better off without him. The creative team paid close attention to continuity, Jorgen has a fun role, and there was a solid message about how one shouldn't do good deeds just to seek validation from peers. However, all of Timmy's friends and family come off as picky jerks to convey that message, Jorgen basically tries to off Timmy even though it was part of his test, and nothing can overshadow how depressing it is at its core. Timmy makes everything worse for the people around him just by existing, and there's nothing he he can do to fix that. Maybe revealing that Jorgen fudged the truth to teach Timmy a lesson would have made the story easier to swallow. It's not like the concept was beyond saving either, since it introduced a pivotal piece of continuity. Jorgen can transform into one thing and one thing only. Uh oh, someone is coming. I must blend in. A few other episodes in Season 5 don't quite come together. In Moving Day, Doug Dimadone goes from a greedy businessman to a full-on supervillain by using genetically modified hypnotizing milk to force zombified Dimsdale citizens to live in a planned community. I'm kind of realizing how ridiculous this sounds when I actually say it out loud. Doug Dimadome? I don't think this evil scheme fits someone who's otherwise a Scooby-Doo level threat. But Dimadome is a better antagonist than Remy Bucks a Plenty. The ending of his last appearance is slightly retconned, so that he can return as Timmy's rival. Although I'm fine with this, because his reintroduction ends up being a farce. There's no way he can remember that I have fairy godparents, right? Um, not unless he saw your flashback. Remy is probably the least memorable part of his other two episodes. Like, I got more excited when the Star Trek ripoff theme from Father Time reappeared for a few seconds. <laughs> At this point, Timmy already had a more fitting frenemy in Jimmy Neutron, and this season brings us two more crossover specials, When Nerds Collide and The Jerkinators. I think these got better as they went along, since they had the opportunity to eventually involve every major hero and villain from both series. The first sequel has Timmy return to Retroville to ask Cindy to be his date for his school's Friday the 13th dance, creating an interdimensional love triangle with Jimmy that's drawn out, but it's complicated with fun action and subplots that it doesn't become irritating. All of the early FOB specials revolved around a different established villain, although Mr. Crocker technically got two. The conflict that the anti-fairies bring is sort of a repeat of the havoc that they caused in their debut, that old black magic. So I'm glad that here, they share the spotlight with Neutron's nemesis, Professor Calamitous. Here's a cookie. In an age where crossovers usually mean putting every single character owned by a media conglomerate into one thing, it's nice to go back to these simple and traditional TV crossovers that give time for their cast to just hang out together. Make me best friends with Morgan Freeman! Now we're getting somewhere! I prefer the third Jimmy Timmy Power Hour for cutting down the infighting between the main duo, giving them an arc, having Jeff Garland play a villain who's equally sweet and menacing, and combining the visual styles in the third act. The 2D characters were turned into 3D models, giving them a Parappa the Rapper, paper cutout type look that still looks great today. Hey look honey, I've lost weight! And depth. Despite being 80 episodes deep into my rewatch, I honestly found the FOP segments annoying when paired with the smarter and, more importantly, quieter writing of Jimmy Neutron. But that's more so a case of personal preference. The Jerkinators is widely considered to be the season finale of both shows, but since I haven't been able to find an intended order for the Fairly Odd Parents, I consider the end of season 5, and my personal highlight, to be Fairy Idol. <laughs> the genie tricks Cosmo and Wanda into quitting their job as fairy godparents, and a singing competition is held to find their replacement. This character was the late great Norm Macdonald's answer to Aladdin's genie, but he didn't return to reprise his role here. Season 5 was packed with guest stars, but he was replaced with a sound-alike. Okay kid, here's the deal. I am Norm. I am Norm! You, my metal mouth friend, get three wishes. 
Fairy Idol is a densely packed 44 minute special that wastes little time with BS. Besides the butch subversions, of course. We are lawn gnomes, not pixies! <laughs> Let's hear it for the pixies! It is hell-bent on bringing back numerous magic characters, it ties up loose ends, and delivers another showstopper in Gimme the Wand. Seeing Norm's theme expanded into a lengthy musical number with verses from Diana to Garmo is just another example of how rewarding this special was for longtime fans. Don't let yourself be kind. now give us the wand. If it has any flaws, it's gotta be these specific references to American Idol's early years. A lot of the shows parodied in Channel Chasers were timeless, or you didn't have to know the reference to get what was going on, but that's not completely the case here. I can see a kid watching this today understanding the format or Simon Cowell stand-in, but I don't blame anyone for thinking that the joke about infamous contestant William Hyung is culturally insensitive. I hate that this isn't the only Chinese stereotype to appear thus far. That'll be seven ninety five. Here for the cookie. <laughs> On the note of other problematic aspects I haven't covered yet, many people online have pointed out that a very large number of plot points and recurring jokes involve both male and female characters becoming or being especially buff. I know that it's usually played for comedy, but it happens far too often not to mention, like it was shockingly easy to find all these clips to illustrate my point. I'll just say that if you like drawing characters this way, more power to you, but a children's television program? Probably not the most appropriate place to do so. Okay, now that I borderline fetish shamed, which I did not think I would do on this channel, let's get back to Fairy Idol. The script for this episode features some notable cuts, like a leprechaun singing a You Can't Touch This parody, an extra Cosmoverse for Gimme the Wand, and most notably, an explanation for the line Cosmo says after he performs. I just sang that! Why did they show it again? Apparently, this was meant to follow a recap of the contestants from Jorgen, which was an invitation for kids to call in and vote online for their favorite singers, implying that the special was going to have alternate endings at some point. I think that a contest component would have worked better in a standalone episode without a lore-heavy character story, similar to what SpongeBob did with its You Wish event, which I covered 10 years ago. It was actually only three years ago, but now this video won't be dated for another seven years. Putting its main gimmick aside, the emotional weight behind the main plot and cameo appearances by the production team give this thing a feeling of finality, like they knew it was going to be one of their last outings, and for a brief few months, it was. We interrupt this program for a sudden cancellation! No! If I had to rank all of the seasons so far, my order at this point in the series would be Season 3, Season 2, Season 4, Season 5, and finally, Season 1. If the first season wasn't a third of the typical length, it probably would have overtaken Season 5. It was a year of high highs and low lows that focused on 11 minute episodes more than boundary pushing epics like it had previously. Maybe it was good that they took a break after this, as the writing went from poking fun at its own formula to actively being sick of it. And I also learned that sometimes I'm sorry can be the only magic words you need. I hope that I helped debunk the idea that this first half decade of episodes was always going uphill in terms of quality, because even though classic Fairly Odd Parents could be just as fun and inventive as I remember, it's also a very loud cartoon, a very mean cartoon, a very cynical cartoon, a very culturally dated cartoon, and a very repetitive cartoon. I do get why they kept doing the yelling though, it's funny sometimes. I may have praised its self-awareness early on, but issues like negative character portrayals and random references for the sake of cheap laughs started to snowball, showing no signs of stopping. Hollywood lied to me! Hollywood lied? Curse you, movie critic Gene Charlotte! This era still has a place in my heart, and it may be a very dark place in my heart, but it'll always be special to me. I'm actually glad that I went out of my way to play Breaking the Rules, because listening to the dialogue was a reminder that things could have been worse. Oh, they could have been worse. Since we are exactly halfway through the run in terms of seasons, I think this is the perfect stopping point, especially because this video is already four times longer than my average script. I'll also say right now that the next video will be about a different topic, since I need to take a bit of a breather. 
but rest assured that the follow-up will be here later this spring. If it comes out in the summer, you can blame Dinkelberg instead of my poor video scheduling. Dinkelberg. I may have missed something important from the first five years when the series was on the air, so let me know and I may cover it later. If you know what I have ahead of me, then trust me when I say that covering these next five seasons is going to drive me insane. I'm going to become Mr. Crocker, but in real life. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for part two of my retrospective of a show starring Fairy Godparents! <laughs>